having Jared problems this morning. They know Richard's not here, right? <laughs> How's everybody doing? <laughs> what? Well, bless your heart. <laughs> All right. There's a lot of love. I'm going to tell Jared to stay home more often. Used to this. <laughs> Can we do solo gold panels next to you? I'm kidding. We all miss my big dumb friend. And I'll just say it now. He look. He had a bad weekend last weekend. He's he's dealing with what he's got to deal with. So just send him some support and love and. When he showed up on set, because uh, he had a couple days off last week, uh, which was turned out to be a good thing. Uh, but when he showed up on set on Wednesday, um, I brought him in in handcuffs. So we were having fun. We're having, we're having fun with it. Um, you know, the, the, the crew really wanted to wear jump, orange jumpsuits. Uh, but, uh, but we couldn't get them in time, so it wasn't like we thought it was a bad idea. We were certainly going to roll with it. Um, anyway, um, he's doing fine. He sends his love, and, uh, and uh, you're stuck with me today, so sorry. And apparently, What's, who's, what's his name? Misha? M M Misha is gonna join me this afternoon for, uh... Now we've, we've done some talks before in the past together, uh, and they've, they've generally ended terribly, so look out for that. Um, well, let's, uh, let's get to some questions if you guys have... Oh, okay, we've got questions. So let's, this is good. Jay's looking up. I was wondering if Dean was going to have a storyline this year. Uh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, the, the, the storyline uh, is, is a little bit more jointed uh, than normal. Usually, you know, we've got one brother doing this, one brother doing that, and they, they kind of deal with their, their own personal situations together. But this year uh, is, is a little bit more... Um, they're both in it together, um, which is I, which is great. You know, I think I think given that uh, you know we're uh, we're heading to the end, I think it's good that we're kind of uh, in it together. So um, so yeah, there's not necessarily a specific storyline that's arcing. There will certainly be episodes where Dean does this thing and Sam's off doing this thing or Dean's with this character and not, you know, Sam's off with this character. Um, I will say that the episode that we're shooting right now, which is, uh, 1510? 1510? Oh, wow. Is yeah. it 1510? Cliff? No, he left. Um, Jason says it is. What? Oh, there he is. Are we 15? Are we on episode 9 or 10 right now? No, we didn't just finish ten. We just finished nine. We just finished episode nine, guys. Just, just wanted to help you keep your your thoughts in order. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I appreciate that. It, it is one of the reasons why um, we can't really function without amazing women on our set. Thank you. If I have any more questions about anything, I'll be watching. I'll, yeah, you always are. Uh, yes, we just finished nine. Oh, I love her. Uh, and we are uh, we're, we're filming ten, and ten is um, ten's going to be. It, it's shaping up to be one of my favorite episodes this season, uh, simply because it's a one-off, and it's a funny one. <laughs> we, 
we had a, we had a fight scene on Friday night that, keep in mind, it was a fight scene, big, like taking on monsters, that had the crew, like, doubled over laughing. <laughs> um, and it's, uh, I'll, I don't think I'm gonna give anything away by saying this, but the premise is essentially uh, Sam and Dean have kind of lost their ability to do things like Winchesters do. <laughs> they can't fight cool anymore. <laughs> Dean's got cavities. <laughs> Sam's got a cold. <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> um, but don't worry, we'll, we'll get our mojo back, I think, in the next episode. So, anyway. uh, as far as acting's concerned, do you have anything on the rise of the actors? Uh, Batman. <laughs> Batman. <laughs> I think that ship has sailed. Uh, <laughs> although somebody was like, hey, dude, there's always the Todd Phillips Batman. Who directed the latest Joker, for those of you who are wondering. I'm like, oh yeah, that would be a nice deep dive into the Dark Knight. Um, uh, nothing, nothing, um, set in stone. Uh, I, um, I've been kind of dragging my feet on that a little bit just because I really wanted to focus on <clears throat> this season and, and, and not, uh, and not get, um, distracted by anything else. And, uh, but I, I am supposed to, uh, go down to, to Los Angeles in the next few weeks and start having some meetings that I've been putting off for a while. So, um, okay. network and studio and, and some producer meetings, just wanting to, to ask me that same question and talk about my future, which I'm like, just kind of, I'm kind of living on that right now. I'm like, hey, people care. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> like, like the studio is concerned, like they're concerned about what I want to do. I'm like, that's, that's great. Um, but what that is, I, I, I have no clue. Um, but uh, when I know, you will know. Oh, I, uh, I freaked out. <laughs> what was that like being the king of that Mardi Gras parade? It was about the best experience you could possibly have. It was my first Mardi Gras. Oh my God. Yeah, no joke. Um, Go big. And yeah, I just kind of like, I don't need to do it anymore. Um, I will. I'll be back this year for sure. Or this this coming uh, this coming Mardi Gras, um, I've already asked time off. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it was it was kind of uh, the most amazing experience, um, and I, I I was able. They were so nice enough to allow me to bring uh, some friends. So I had I had a few friends that that came with me, other than my family. They came with me for the uh, <clears throat> for the experience and. They're still talking about that being the greatest weekend of their life. And these are guys that like get out and have fun. And they're like, this is that was the greatest weekend of their lives. Um, yeah, it was it was pretty special and, and I just didn't I didn't understand how big being King of Bacchus was until I arrived at the airport. And you know, they don't allow people past security unless you're actually flying on a plane. I walk off the jetway, keep in mind, I, I worked all night, I took like a 6 a.m. flight to get there, so I was like, okay, I know there's probably gonna be like, people that are gonna greet me when, you know, I get down to baggage claim or something. And I'll just, I'll stop in the bathroom and, you know, freshen myself up, <laughs> splash some water on my face, do what I need to do to just be presentable. Walk off the jetway and there was a brass band. <laughs> So I turned around and ran back on the plane. <laughs> but it, seriously, it was like there was people. There was like you know the chief of police, and there was like the the the, and the Brennans who who uh, run Bacchus, and uh, and my wife and JJ, and she comes running up to me, and I'm like, that. I mean, I remember some of you aren't even old enough to remember this, but I remember when you could walk your family members or yeah. your friends to the gate yeah. and, and like wave goodbye or wait for them at the gate when they got off the plane. And, and, um, and obviously we, we haven't been able to do that for some time now, but so to see all of these people inside security and like, 
And my daughter's running up to me, and I'm like, what's happening to me? That was just a taste. And then we ended up getting into a, uh, uh, what do you call it, an escort? A motorcade, thank you. Uh, we get into the motorcade, and there were four different uh, departments, I think, four or five different departments. There was like the sheriff's department, the highway department, the, the local police, and then there was, I think, the, the fire department. Or something. There was like everybody involved. It was like everyone. And then somebody leans over and is like, the president doesn't get this many people. <laughs> um, and that's kind of when I was like, oh, damn, this is big. Like, <laughs> I better, <laughs> I better turn it up. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was, uh, it was quite an experience and I, I, I don't know that I'll ever have something that, that big for a first time situation, but I'm, I'm happy you were there. I hope I didn't peg you in the face with beats. <laughs> later that that, that later happened, I did hit you in the face with beats? Somebody else did. Okay. Well, apparently that happens a lot. There's a, another parade called the Muses Parade, which happens uh, on Thursdays. The Bacchus one is on Sunday. And we were eating at a restaurant while the parade was going by. We were eating at the Pontchartrain Hotel, which is a great place if you ever go. And we walked out after we finished dinner to see. And I was like, I was like, I just don't get it. Like, it's like plastic beads. They gotta cost two cents, you know? Why are people, people are going crazy. And I'm like, I don't get it. I walk out there and I'm like, give me the beads! <laughs> totally fell for it. And I was just like, I was screaming. And, and the, I don't know what it is. If you've never been, there's just something like animalistic that comes out where you, you need to catch something from the floats. And you, you make eye contact with somebody. It's like the greatest thing ever. You're like, yes! Throw me the beads! Well, in the muses, in the muses parade, there's they're throwing beads and they're throwing other stuff. And there's also they have decorated these high heel shoes because it's an all woman parade. There's only women uh, riding on the floats. Um, and yeah, they keep everything very separate down there because <laughs> the Bacchus parade was only men. Um, but hey, everybody's got their parade, so. Uh, good times. And then they have this, uh, the high-heeled shoe that they've decorated that is like the special get from the, the parade. So people will be tossing out, tossing out beads, tossing out beads, and then every now and again you'll get a tosser who will pick up this shoe and that's like, I mean, that's like the big catch. Well, somebody, one of them picked up a shoe as they were passing us and my father-in-law was standing next to me and, and he was just enjoying the parade. <laughs> Next thing you know, boom. And he took a high heel right off the dome. And it like split him open. No, 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 like it's, it's like full contact sport. This is, if you go to Mardi Gras, wear a helmet. Um, but when I, I remember being up on the, on the big king's throne, I guess, and you know, they kept feeding me these, these the, the beads to throw, and then there were also these little, uh, they're like plastic coins, they're called doubloons, and um, they have buckets of them, and so I kept, I'd like reach in, grab handfuls, and just chuck them. And after, after a while, I noticed there was like, the, the coins, are, they were silver, and I noticed that they were starting to turn red. And so I was like, what's happening? And I looked at my fingers, and they were just bloody. So that there was picking, I was like digging my hands into these like plastic, these buckets full of plastic coins and they were just shredding my hands up. So I stopped doing that. <laughs> nobody wants bloody coins. <laughs> and so I started just throwing the beads and it turned into like a video game for me. Like I get the beads and I, I, instead of just like throwing them like a frisbee, which didn't really work, I would ball them up <laughs> and it was like, <laughs> Best. It was, I don't know why it was so satisfying. If I made eye contact with somebody, it'd be like... <laughs> and if they would catch it, it was like, I'd get points. And I, and I was all of a sudden living in like this Ready Player One world, where there was like life and points, and I was like... I don't know. I just, I just turned it 
turned into a child up there, but it was, it was amazing. So anyway, hope to see you there one day. Yes. It is. And you've been directing a couple times over the years. What are some things you've, some things you've learned over that time, either about yourself as a director or just the process itself? Uh, so she was saying that the, this, uh, the episode that airs on Thursday is the one that I directed this season. Yeah. And what have, I, what have I learned over the process of, I think it was my, I think this is my sixth, sixth one that I've done. Um, a lot. I've learned a lot. And it's, uh, to my detriment, because I, I feel like the first episode I did w was so easy, <laughs> and it was because I knew so little. <laughs> it's the whole like ignorance is bliss thing. Uh, but the more that I have, um, the more that I have directed, the, the obviously the more uh, the more knowledge I've picked up, and so um, it's like it's like accumulating more tools. So the you know the workshops got a little bigger in my head, and it's. Uh, it's tough. Uh, directing is not an easy task on, by any means. Um, you know, I often say that as an actor, uh, I'm responsible for my role, one link in the chain. And as a director, I'm responsible for every link. And so it's a lot to think about. Um, and you have to, uh, you know, you not only have to visualize the story in your head, figure out how you want to tell that story from a visual perspective, communicate that properly to every department head there is, and then on the day, if something goes wrong, be able to audible and shift and and uh, and scramble to make the story make sense. And I've had some really amazing mentors, um, from Kim Manners to Bob Singer, uh, to, Bob Singer to uh, Phil Scrisha to, um, to a lot of the guys, John Showalter, who's directing this episode right now, a lot of these guys I watch who have been really successful over the years, and I just kind of watch how and see not only how they do it from a technical standpoint, but also how they command a set. Because um, there's nothing worse than when we get directors on there that um, look like deer in headlights. Yeah. And that's the, that's the worst thing, and that's the first, that's, that's the quickest way to lose a crew, is when something goes wrong and there's no answer. Because you got 80 sets of eyes looking at you for the answer, because they're all like, what do we do now, boss? <laughs> and if you don't at least come up with something quick, they're gonna be like, whatever. <laughs> and one of the best pieces of advice that I ever got was from Phil. He said, you're gonna get asked a million questions uh, every day. <laughs> and it is true. Okay. You do, you can like, even, not just during prep, but even when you're on the set, there's constantly questions rolling in. And he's like, have an answer. And this can be applicable to a lot of different um, jobs and a lot of different industries, I think. When people ask you a question, have an answer. Um, you can always change your mind. But the moment you say, I don't care, or it doesn't matter, you've just diminished that person's job. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, it's basically just like care. Care what people are bringing to you. Care about the decisions that you're making. Care about their job and their pro their their piece of this puzzle. Um, so it's it's tough. It's a balance. You got to like keep all of this in mind. You got to lead the crew. You got to have an, you got to have, have answers. And um, it's uh, it's I've seen people come and, and fail, and I've seen people come and succeed. And I just try to I just try to be on the ladder and try to watch those people that succeed and, and emulate that because. Uh, um, as uh, there's a Bob Singer says, he's like, hey, if you're gonna steal, steal from the best. So that's what I try to do. <laughs> um, all right, let's go over here, waving like this. Yeah, I see, yeah. Hi, Jim. Hi. First off, you, you are beautiful. <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> Well, thanks for getting that out of the way. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, if you yourself had to face some of the monsters, ghosts, the demons that poor Dean's had to face, what would you do? <laughs> Run. <laughs> yeah. um, I'd I call Dean Winchester. Um, 
I, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, the, I often say that um, Dean is, uh, I enjoy playing Dean and I, I've done it for so long and um, I think I've been uh, successful in doing so because he is a part of me. He's a, he's a exaggerated part of my personality. And, you know, sometimes I hear people say, oh, your Dean is showing. <laughs> yeah, because he's, he's in here. And they're like, what's, you know, uh, people have asked, you know, what's gonna happen when the show's done, uh, you know, and, and Dean is gone forever. And I'm like, Dean is not gone, he's right in here. I got him, he's right here. Um, and I was not, I was not classically trained as an actor. I didn't go to, to school for it. Um, I didn't train under a certain uh, style or any of that. So um, the way that I, uh, the way that I, I work or the way that I, I tell the story through a character is I use my own experience. I use my own personality. I use things that make sense to me. How would a part of me react in this situation? So, part of me would like to think that if I was faced with an actual monster, I would react like Dean because that's a part of my personality. There's also other parts of my personality. <laughs> and I might go screaming like a little child uh, because there's certainly a little child inside here. Um, <laughs> now I'm like multi -per multiple personalities. <laughs> now I've got issues. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I will say this. I've done haunted houses for a lot of my adult life every Halloween, and I am rarely scared. <laughs> so that kind of gives me a little hope in the fact that in the face of danger, I wouldn't go running. I would face it head on, and I would like to channel as much Dean Winchester as I can. <laughs> Oh, hang on, you got a mic coming right there. We can all hear. Given the long run of the story, mm -hmm. the series, and many directions it's taken over the years, are you pleased with the way it's going to end? Oh, yeah, I had to throw that one back. <laughs> um, I've talked about this a little bit before. Uh, some of you may have heard this, um, but we, we went and sat down in the writer's room uh, over the summer, and um, and that's the first time we've done that ever in 15 years or 14 years, I guess. And and they gave us the pitch on what they had thought or what they were planning to do for the end of the show. And uh, and we, I heard the pitch, and I was like, okay. And at first, I was I, I was kind of. Uh, I didn't, I, it just, it didn't sit well with me. Um, and I, I, I went home, I slept on it, thought about it for a few days, and I just, I was like, I just, I don't, I don't know, I, I just, I wasn't, I wasn't digging it. And, and so I, I was talking to my wife about it, and she was like, well, you should call, um, you should call somebody and talk to them about it. And I'm like, well, who? Everybody that was, you know, was, would be, was there in the room. Like, they're all, they're all on board. Um, and she said, call Eric, who, Kripke, who created the show. Who's not, a, who's not on the show anymore. He's off doing the, the Boys, which is a different show, which is fantastic. If you haven't seen it. It's great. Um, so I called him up and I said, hey man, you built this world. These are your characters that you created. This is how we're going to wrap it up. I'm having a problem digesting it, and I need your take on it. Just from an outsider's perspective who understands the world uh, as well as he did. And he said, "Let me. I'm getting on a plane right now. Let me think about it. I'll send you, I'll send you an email. Great. So I got an email the next day, and he, he broke it down in a way that really made sense. And, and he basically reminded me, he was like, you're too close to it. You got to step back and look at it from a from an audience perspective, from from a fan perspective, and think about what this is, what the characters are going to go through, what the story is going to go through, and how that is going to settle 
once all the dust clears. And I thought about it, and he was right. And now I really uh, am excited about the ending of the show. And I think I think you guys will too. And again, if at first you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Take a minute, step step back, and look at it maybe from a broader perspective, and think about how other endings might not might have fallen a little short or a little flat compared to what we're doing. So I hope you guys like it. We're going to try our best to knock it out of the park, like we always do. Okay. You guys have been with us for a long, long time. We don't want to let you down. I don't want to let myself down. I don't want to let my friends and our cast and our crew down. So this is not us just kind of drifting off into the night. This is us going out with as big a fireworks show as you can possibly have. Uh, on that note, I think they're pulling me off the stage. That's it? All right, Cliff's gonna tackle me in a minute. Uh, well, hey guys, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for not getting the news that Jared was here, taking off and leaving me here by myself with nobody here. Uh, I appreciate you guys. Um, thank you, love y'all. I'll see y'all later. I'm double denim today. You're hogging my camera. Oh, you're hogging it. Those two cute boys at the WB Supernatural hit the Museum of Television and Radio's Paley Festival, and the result was sheer pandemonium. Tonight, we had our first screaming, crying girls. Can I do a reenactment? Oh my God. Definitely mistaken me for somebody else. Maybe I should put makeup on. Maybe they know something without makeup. Yeah, that must be it. As for what's coming up on the show... Let's just say that the father will be coming back. We've been working uh, pretty heavily with uh, Jeffrey Dean Morgan, who plays the dad. Wait a minute. When where uh, a series three begins? Uh, yeah, series two ends with, um, with the Winchester boys inadvertently loosing a, a, an army of demons out of the gates of hell, literally. <laughs> And um, also with the uh, with the realization that Dean, uh, my brother in the show, has only a year to live because he's basically sold his soul to the devil to bring me back to life. So season three opens with us sort of both confronting the harsh reality of, of what we've just done with letting an army of demons <laughs> out of hell and also with not only do I have to worry about you know hundreds and hundreds of demons, but we have to save my brother's life because mm -hmm. um, otherwise in a year he just drops dead. So um, we have to try and fix that. <laughs> what does Sam make of the deal that Dean struck? Um, he's, he's obviously a little disappointed and a little sad, but he's, he's learned in the last two seasons, or in the first two seasons, he learned the hard way not to, um, not to sit and worry about things and be disappointed in things, but just to take action. You know, maybe he learned it from Dean, you know, as opposed to mm. sitting here and, and contemplating and weighing this and weighing that and, you know, sort of making a pro-con list. Let me just put my two feet on the ground and hit the road and, and do something about it. You know, I don't know what I'm going to do about it yet, but I'm going to do something and okay. I'll find out as I go. Has some changed much since he's been a, a lot, A lot. I mean, that, um, just the very fact that he's now an action taker as opposed to sort of a thinker is, is a huge change because he was always the... Um, I mean, especially from episode one, or the pilot episode of season one, he's just going, you know, I'm just a college kid, like, leave me alone, I just mm -hmm. want to go be a lawyer, have my 2.3 kids, and my, you know, little house in the suburbs, and my dog, and my van, and live my life. And then he's like, oh, I'll help you out this one time. And then he sort of gets drawn in, his, obviously his girlfriend gets killed, his, he runs back into his father, um, uh, salvages a relationship with his father, and then loses his father, and he just, his world has been thrown for mm -hmm. a loop. He's starting to find out things about himself that um, he didn't really know and he doesn't want to know, that he might not be completely human. He found out that his father, who he finally made amends with, told his brother, um, if you can't save your brother, being me, then you have to kill him, <laughs> meaning kill me. Um, and so he's, he's, really, he's really been thrown for several, several loops um, in, the, in the last 56 episodes. So um, he's changed accordingly. He's hardened, I guess. Of course, yeah. yeah. He's hardened, and he's also um, just his motivations have changed. Um, it's not only has he become sort of a tougher, harder person, but he's changed the reasons he's doing what he's doing. He used to be doing it sort of to help his brother slash please his father and do what he thinks he's he's good at, and now he really wants to get out there and get rid of these things that are, um, you know, hunting down humans and. Now get rid of the demons and save his brother. Have we seen the last of the, the yellow-eyed demon? 
Um, we have so far. I, I don't know um, what the plans were for the end of the season three, but we found out that the yellow-eyed demon was um, was the biggest, baddest demon we knew of, but not the biggest, baddest demon there was. Okay. Um, and there was there was a demon that he answered to, and so that's um, even more uh, what we need to take care of. So as far as I know, yellow demon's out, but worst demon is in. So this more to come. Yeah, out of the <laughs> what's the out of the frying pan into the fire. Yeah, yeah. And um, what about Sam and Dean's dad? Is there any possibility he could come? I back mean, it's his... supernatural, so of course there's possibility. <laughs> um, realistically, Jeffrey Dean Morgan, who plays our father, who, who I love to death has been extremely busy ever since uh, Supernatural and Grey's Anatomy ended for him. He's been doing movie after movie after movie and keeping very busy. And so uh, he's been dying to come back. And, and I think the writers have some, some ideas for how he could come back or why he would come back. But it just logistically, it's hard to work out okay. um, the timing for him to come back. But I hope so. We, we love him out there. And, we, and obviously, he does a great job on the show. Never say never. Never say never. Mm -hmm. Not in Supernatural. What's I mean, I came back from the dead. So, <laughs> you know, who knows what can happen with him? What's been your favorite episode of Supernatural so far? Um, Does one stand out? Yeah, um, I mean the the season finales of of both season one and season two um, are two of my favorites that pop into my head. Um, I still love the pilot, and um, I remember one of my favorite ones to shoot was from season one. Um, I know it's going back a long time. But it was uh, it was the shapeshifter episode. It was called Skin, and it's where my brother gets um, gets uh, sort of doubled by a shapeshifter. And so there's a there's a big fight scene between brother and brother. And I just love the mythology of it and the archetypes of brother versus brother and good versus evil and what's going on. And you know you never really know um, if he's real or if he's um, fake, so to speak. So <laughs> I remember that was one of my favorite ones, and, and one of my favorite ones to go back and watch. Um, and then also, uh, I mean, that's the one that sticks out in my head, I guess. Do you watch the old episodes a lot? I do. I, I, um, I, watch, them, I watch them every now and again, especially if we have something in, a, in an episode that, that refers back to, um, to one of the other episodes or something where, where I'm reading through the script and I go, that makes me think of what happened in that one episode where, and I'll just put on my DVD or go to iTunes and, and, and watch it on my iTunes on my computer. Um, more for research okay. than for pleasure. Um, I've never really liked watching myself, um, so I'll do it really to, to research something that I think needs to be researched. Okay. Or if there's an episode where, um, you know, Sam this year has starting has been starting to turn into um, a lot like his brother, a lot mm -hmm. like Dean, and he says in one of the episodes, you know, I'm trying to be more like you. Um, and there are a few scripts that I've been reading, you know, and it's just... The, Sam kills a demon and it, it refers back to the look on his face and I'm thinking oh that must be like when Dean killed the vampire and had that look on his face where his face is full of blood and I'll go back and watch and I'll be like okay and just try and I don't want to say like channel that energy but okay. try and but try and do something half for myself half for the fans that's reminiscent of a prior episode okay. um, so cool. yeah over here um, ITV marketed the show as um, scary just got sexy yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, I'm the scary part. Jensen's the sexy part. So, are you comfortable with being a pinup? That kind of uh, thing. It's so funny. It's so funny because I, I mean, I see people, I see like really good-looking dudes and good-looking chicks like um, saying, "I don't see myself as a sex symbol," and kind of doing the sex symbol thing. And you're always like, "Oh, they're full of it." But I, I do not see myself as a sex symbol. I do not. Like, I, I just, I, um, I understand that. Like, it's scary, just got sexy or whatever. And I know that's half marketing and half whatever, but it's just funny to me. Like, I, I, I if, if someone likes the way I look or something, mm. then great, um, fantastic. If that will get somebody to watch the show, mm. then um, awesome, you know? Because <laughs> uh, I, I, I love to be known for my work. Ultimately, I mean, I'm 25, so whatever looks I do or don't have right now are just going to go downhill from here. So I don't want to <laughs> be known for, like, being a good looking guy or okay. you know, a decent looking guy. I'd rather be known for my work. But if it'll get somebody to watch my work, then hopefully they'll like that. And so but whatever, it's flattering. It's very flattering. Okay. Um, so I don't want to say like no, you know. Don't. Definitely it was completely spontaneous. Uh, he just missed a cue and, and I just kinda I missed a cue on purpose. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. He did yeah, he didn't miss it. He he sat there and was like, I'm gonna see what Jensen does if I don't enter the scene. So that's kinda what happened. Um, and and the reason it kind of, you know, blew up was uh, 
uh, Phil Segrisha, who is our post-production producer, who also directs a lot of episodes, um, who also does our, our gag reel and stuff like that. He kind of took it and ran with it and, and wanted to, to make it, you know, make something of it. And, uh, you know, he, he called me and was like, hey, dude, do you mind if, if we do something? Like, people are really responding to this. And the guys over at Warner Brothers are loving it. And I'm like, it's a goof. <laughs> yeah. So it was just kind of one of those things that, you know, uh, was, was fun and, and turned out and they, they caught it on tape. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen a whole lot because, I mean, we'll mess up during takes or we'll try, try and, you know, get each other to laugh or break during takes. But for it to go on that long, usually the directors will cut. But since Phil's one of our producers and since he has a past in editing and he likes to have fun on set and he likes to have a good time and improvise, he was like, roll it, let's see what happens. And so I was kind of lucky. And it's, it's fun, too. It also, you know, it's, uh, we, shoot, we shoot so long and so, so uh, many hours that, um, you know, this crew is, is, has become our family. And, and so when we get a chance to, you know, have fun or, or break the ice or break the monotony, then it's... Uh, you know, we have a good time doing it, but I mean, those guys, those guys see us clown around all the time, so it's, uh, you know, it's nothing new to them. Well, we would definitely like to watch more clips of Jared Padalecki and Jensen Ackles clowning around, but what about the actual supernatural scenes? Do they enjoy comedy more than drama, or is it the other way around? I like the balance. I, I think that that's one of the the, um, the real key elements to the success of the show is the fact that it's uh, it's not all dramatic. Um, that there's, you know, there's comedy feathered into it uh, here and there, and I think that, that uh, it, it just makes it a little bit more palpable uh, as, a, as a, a dramatic series, is, is to have those kind of lighter moments and, and to see, uh, you know, see the lighter side of the characters and, and poke fun at each other and, and, and also, you know, have that, have that kind of amusement between, uh, between characters and between brothers and, and stuff like that. I think it's just uh, it's a little bit more attractive than having kind of a single note the entire time. That was scary. Him screaming when the uh, cat jumps out of the locker. It was a lot of fun because, once again, they just let the cameras roll. And probably as gag footage, they'll show some of the other takes or something. Cause oh, yeah, because they only showed about a, a split second of, yeah. of that reaction. But yeah. they, because it was Phil, he was like, I want you to go as long. And it said in the script, it was like, screams as long. I want Dean to scream as, scream as long as he possibly can. Yeah. So <laughs> it was, uh, I'm sure it'll be in the gag reel how long I was actually screaming. It was, it was fun. embarrassing. But, yeah. And the drama, like the, the season finales of, of each season, you know, like the last two episodes are usually dark and scary and, you know, there's, there's a lot of pace to it, like something's happening, we have to race against the clock. Um, and they're always so exhausting. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're like, okay, I'm crying all day, or okay, I'm running around and like screaming and trying to close the devil's gate all day. Yeah, that can't be easy, but we sure love to watch it. Keep hitting us up for more exclusive interviews on The CW Source. Thank you. <laughs> These were clearly for somebody who's not 6'4". I'm <laughs> sort of doing this. Sorry. Gen generally, nothing in life is for people that are 6'4". Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I got it. I got it. I got it. Uh, it is, uh, it's truly an honor to, uh, to join the Saturn Awards celebration tonight and present the Dan Curtis Legacy Award. So to diehard genre TV fans, programming such as Dark Shadows, The Night Stalker, and Trilogy of Terror conjure fond memories of suspenseful television, which not only live on in our memories, but also stand the test of time. Though diverse, 
One thing these classic genre television shows all have in common is their creator, famed writer, director, producer, Dan Curtis. <laughs> Named in his honor, the Dan Curtis Legacy Award salutes fellow masters of genre TV and other quality programming. Yeah, now this Saturn tradition began with such masterful storytellers as Vince Gilligan of Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul, and Brian Fuller of Hannibal, which are both represented here tonight. They're both here, let's give them a round of applause. Tonight, Jared and I are here to bestow the Dan Curtis Legacy Award to a television writer, director, and producer who is very near and dear to our collective hearts and souls. <clears throat> the creator of Supernatural, the uh, longest running American genre series on TV, Eric Kripke. <clears throat> now without Eric's creative spark, the Winchester brothers would have never been born and the world would have surely been overrun by demons and angels and monsters. Yeah, and Jensen and I might not have been forcibly imprisoned, <clears throat> gainfully employed for 12 years. <clears throat> <laughs> it actually says that I'm supposed to chuckle there. So. <laughs> so. <laughs> it's, it's actually calling you chuckles is what it's doing. It's been a lot of fun. <laughs> like many of you here tonight, one of Eric's biggest influences was acclaimed uh, science fiction author Richard Matheson of Twilight Zone fame, one of my personal favorites. <clears throat> In fact, his boyhood dream was to film a Matheson story as his film school's... I'm going to do that again. What's that? His boyhood dream was to film a Matheson story as his film school project. When Matheson's reps said no, Eric, naturally, contacted Matheson directly. <clears throat> Matheson faxed back his blessing for the film, which helped launch his career. And for any millennials out there, faxes are sort of the old school form of emails. <laughs> or texts, or Snapchats, or whatever it's called. Yeah, we got it. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. <clears throat> Eric always considered himself a purveyor of genre material that is for sci-fi fantasy because it allows for an exploration of ideals. And his, God bless. Go. <sighs> Did you write this, Eric? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Eric is wildly handsome, um, hung like a racehorse. Who wrote this? <laughs> In his first foray into the world of television was a modern-day version of Edgar Rice Burroughs' Tarzan for the WB. Right. Next, Eric wrote a screenplay for the horror film Boogeyman, which was released in early 2005 and spawned two sequels. However, in the same year, uh, he created his signature TV series, which we have heard about, uh, Supernatural. <clears throat> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> the series' origin has various incarnations and was originally pitched as Star Wars in Truck Stop America and called Unnatural, probably more fitting yeah. given yeah. it's... Be, <clears throat> at one yeah. point, Eric wanted to do an anthology show, and then was, it was to be a series about a reporter who worked for a tabloid magazine, you know, like Kolchak, the Night Stalker, which appropriately was produced by Dan Curtis. Yeah. <clears throat> Finally, he settled on the idea of telling these stories in the format of this. Route 66, the great American road trip with the two brothers, the Winchesters. Now, Supernatural first aired on the WB in 2005 and then segued onto its current home, who a lot of us are here tonight employed by, the CW. <clears throat> Where thanks to our deeply dedicated fan base, the show has been on uh, ever since. Eric was the showrunner for seasons one through five. Uh, then he stayed on as writer, executive producer for season six, and has been an executive consultant since season seven. And he's currently chugging wine. Yes. Um, I see him. Uh, <laughs> ne never one to rest on so his he's, he's been a producer longer than he's been a writer of his own show. Jesus, that's amazing. Uh, it's disgusting. Never one to rest on his laurels. Eric joined forces with executive producers. <laughs> he joined forces with J.J. Abrams, Brian Burke, and John Favreau to create Revolution. Airing on NBC from 2012-2014, the show centered around a group of characters struggling to survive and reunite with loved ones in a post-apocalyptic world where everything electronic has mysteriously stopped working. Nominated for seven Saturn Awards. I think we were nominated for seven Saturn yeah. Awards. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> However, 
Revolution won twice for Damn best it. network TV series. <laughs> See what happens when you leave us? <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Breathe, 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 breathe. Next up, his highly anticipated time travel series on NBC <laughs> coming this fall <laughs> called Timeless. The series... God, here we go. Watch. Uh, yeah. <laughs> The series is about an unlikely trio traveling through time, <laughs> battling unknown criminals in order to protect history as we know it, which is destined to become a Saturn favorite. You wrote this. You, you totally wrote this. wrote this. You totally wrote this. We get it. Destined to become a Saturn favorite? Come on, man. <laughs> wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Uh, all right. In the meantime, let's enjoy some highlights from Kripke's amazing productions. 